right, all right. We'll just get close well, to you. You may not understand my accent, so I'm trying to speak a bit slightly. All right. So what would you like to do? Well, all right, I just wanted to tell everyone, I'm kind of in awe today because there's so many great crocodile conservationists, biologists, and professors. And this is an author. Uh, he is a, as I said with Rom, he's one of the people that was the tip of the spear for crocodile conservation in Australia and the world, and he also sits as the head of the CSG, which is the Crocodile Specialist Group. Um, so this man is intimately involved in crocodile conservation, and we're here today for the gharial. But there's another animal that you know intimately, uh, and that is the saltwater crocodile. And talk to me a little bit about some of the work that you did uh, in Australia for that species. In a nutshell, we're going to put like 40, 50 years of expertise into like yeah, five minutes. Well, Good luck. I guess in the, in the early 70s, the saltwater crocodile had been hunted to really low, low, low levels. 99% biomass reduction. So there was only a remnant left. Nobody knew whether they'd survive. And they'd never really been researched. So I came in at that time and it was very much pioneering research. We, we, nobody knew anything else. You, know, yeah. you, you were there and everything you... It's the most exciting form of research, you know, because every day you see something and you ask a question that nobody can answer, you've got to answer it yourself. And so I always say at that time when you you only got two companions, Mr. Risk and Mrs. Uncertainty, and you were there, and you've got to take risks and you're learning at a rapid pace. So I was lucky to be able to do all the pioneering work on nesting and reproduction and growth and movement and uh, feeding and just everything. And then you know, I was able to work on freshwater problems. We've got an endemic freshwater problem. And so I was able to do that more efficiently because I've already done the salt work problem. So by the early 1980s, I just had a lot of experience with two different species that are quite different. And again, I guess the world started to become interested in crocodiles. So I couldn't get off the train. Yeah. And I've been on it ever since. Right, so, fantastic. I, you know, I've worked on lots of different things, on anatomy and physiology and ecology and, and uh, population dynamics. And, and then I guess... What happened with saltwater crocodiles when they started to recover, management wasn't an issue when I started because there weren't any left. But by 79, 80, they were clearly coming back with a vengeance and they started eating people again. These, right. are, these are a very big crocodile and they, you can't sugarcoat it. They're, they're incredibly dangerous. They're, so we had really to face a problem when they started killing people and the public started to say, well, how many are you going to have, you know, where does this stop? Gotcha. So we had to head in the direction of sustainable use, that where the conservation was going to be profitable for the landowners and not, not you know, a cost for them to wear. And that was very successful, so to cut a long story short, our populations have come back to where they were historically, it's, which is unbelievable for a big, serious predator like yeah. saltwater crocodiles. They're unbelievably dangerous. The public is well educated about them. We take all the crocodiles out of Darwin Harbour, which is the main place people live. It's a very remote area. We take out about 250 a year, and they just we, we try to make them extinct, and they can't. They just keep coming in. So we take them out. They used to go to farms for breeding, but now there's so many that they just get sold as skins and meat. And that's uh, some people, you know, find cringe. that cringe. they cringe. And you know, I used to be one of those people. Like, yep. in fact, yep. guys, really quick, and it's great that I have your quick yep. story. Is I did my first bull gator roundup at this facility years ago and we, we wrangled up some gators and for lunch we ate alligator and I was like oh, what, 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 what are we doing what are we doing and then I learned that it's only because of the management of these animals why we have over a million uh, alligators in the United States in Florida 
So I've changed. Yeah, well, I tell you, know? you what it's to be. Historically, predators and people were considered the enemy. They were ungodly, right. they were everything. Right. And everyone had all sorts of ways of killing them because they're predators on people. And people have done that all through history. So when you start to conserve a predator, if your conservation is successful and you rebuild the number of predators, they're going to start eating people. Yeah. <laughs> and with saltwater coral, it's a serious problem. Like some of the work we've just been doing, we're very proud of what we've done with the product. We've got landowners and Aboriginal landowners all getting paid for the eggs. They're earning money. Everyone's earning money out. But the one thing we didn't figure, these are a sea game. Now we know that in East Timor, which is only 450 kilometres away, yeah. they are having one person killed a month. And, and they, you would think crocs. it's your crocs from Northern Australia? Without a doubt. This is really cool research, guys. I yeah. just recently read this online. Yeah. And, you know, of course, they go to the, the right guy to, to study this. So explain so a little bit. Well, we're trying to work it out. I was up in East Timor, and I, there was something. East Timor has a very interesting history and they got their independence after a very brutal civil war. The, the way in which the crocodile attacks had increased was so fast that I had trouble believing it could have been from intrinsic breeding, breeding within East Timor. And in East Timor, the people revere crocodiles. So they're the grandfather of the people. And as the president said to me, see the problem they've got now is the grandfather is eating the grandkids. Yeah. So a lot of people still don't want a crocodile killed. And if someone gets attacked by a crocodile, the crocodile is the good crocodile. And the people have done something wrong. So a lot of people won't even report it. Because wow. it means their family has done something wrong. Something wrong yeah. So we looked at this whole situation and I looked and the critical bit of evidence was I went to one of the big oil rigs between East Timor and Australia. And they had five records of soldiers swimming one way or the other at the oil rig in the middle of the ocean. And they're only like looking during the day and they're only seeing, you know, maybe half a kilometre. So if they said five, how many are really moving? Really moving. It could be hundreds and hundreds. And everything ties together because big crocs, just about everything they eat, stop growing and it goes into maintenance. Now they suddenly have to swim four or five hundred kilometres without eating. By the time they get to a new area, they're hungry, their fat reserves are down, they don't have a territory, so they're wandering around the coast, and they're turning up in areas where there's not normal crop. So most of the people are getting taken to fishermen, or subsistence fishermen, but the same thing is happening in West Timor, and the same thing is happening probably in other parts of Indonesia. So right now, there's a whole series of evidence that I guess it's all circumstantial, but if it quacks like a duck, or it looks like a duck, there's a good chance it is a duck. Right, and right. So when people are getting killed, you can't hold back on this. You've got to start coming out and letting people know. Yeah. And right now they're organising the samples, and we will be able to tell from the DNA whether this is the case. So, uh, yeah, we can try to disprove it, but uh, personally, I don't think there's a chance in hell we will disprove it. Right. We get the samples that will show they're the same genetic makeup. Of, of so the, Australian the management problem is going to be very complex, but the people themselves recognise the good crocodile from yep. East Timor yep. and the troublemaker crocodiles that just gotcha. appear there. So maybe there's a mechanism where we can take out the, the troublemaker crocs that'll be acceptable to the people of East Timor. So wow. management is always a problem and then in the Solomon Islands, which is over the other side, yeah, the guy's just working on that now. And I think he's, he's so far logged down 230 something attacks in the last 20 years and 
thirty percent of those are on kids, mm. and it's the same type of thing. You know, yeah. Some of these saltwater crocodiles are a really serious predator. Like if you went to the Adelaide River just outside of Darwin and you dived off the Adelaide River and started swimming. The only question would be, are you going to get survive for five minutes, right. for ten minutes? You'd never get to fifteen minutes. Yeah. You'd be killed. It, it's just it's, like that. So mm -hmm. it's it, it's no good trying to sugarcoat it. I I like props. You know, I have their intrinsic value very high. But in order to conserve them, they've got to promote other values. Right, and it's a tough yeah. sell to get everyone to love a non-cuddly animal, apex predator. Yeah. Well, yeah, well, <laughs> you see that, the thing, even the apex predator stuff I question, because we tested it. In, by 1971, there were no crocodiles left. Just as many crabs, more crabs, just as many barramundi, probably more barramundi, oh. and not one, there's nothing we can point at it changed when you took the crocs out. Crazy. So even though theoretically everyone's all the apex predator and all that stuff, a lot of it's ecological myths and legends. The reality is that you're either going to have crocs or you're not going to have okay. Now we exploit them for skins, for meat, for tourism. They're one of the biggest things that attract people's attention to the north. And our biggest industry is tourism. So they play a valuable role in our little community. They generate an industry now, I think it was estimated 106 million a year, which for us is very big. You know, we're a very, very big state, 1.3 million square kilometers, and we've only got 230,000 people. So 30% of those are Aboriginal. Like, wow. You know, real Aboriginal. So yeah. Still living traditional lifestyles and stuff. So it's a complex. Whole, it, yeah. You know, our way of managing things suits us. You can't manage them that way in East Timor, and you can't manage them that way in the Solomons, and so you just need a different. Conservation is about. It's not about process. It's not about we'll do what they do. You know, we'll just transpire something you do from say here to there. It's right. not going to work. No, different cultures. You've got to rebuild jobs. the program because the least important variable is biology. The most important variable is the people. Gotcha. And if you fundamentally don't like people. Yeah, gonna, don't get into conservation. Get, get into that's really something great. else because no, it's about people. That that's interesting, and that's that's one of the things that I've come to know as I've gotten older. When you're a young guy, yeah. you're very idealistic, and I always say, you know, you'll hear people say, "Oh, I love animals more than people." But look what we're doing. We're communicating to you out there, and you have to have a desire to meet and talk to people. You have to do it if you want to save well, animals. You've got to be, uh, you know, I always say there's ten words that are fundamental foundation of conservation. All right. Tolerance, respect, and understanding of all people's cultures and traditions. That's if you don't go into that, yeah. we, you don't have it. You, you, you sort of think people are lesser people because they're out with a spear, spear and something like that. Then don't get into conservation. Gotcha. <laughs> Because well, you can't change the people. You can't. <coughs> you can't go in. But it's good science behind it, and it, it's science of time scale. You, conservation usually operates on a time scale of say ten years. You need to conserve something now, not not tomorrow. Now you've only got a window. It's no good coming in saying the first thing we've got to do is change the whole culture of the people before we can consume it. Because that might take a hundred years. hundred years, so exactly. That, that's a, a fundamental science no-no to have problems at different levels of resolution in time scale. So what you got to do is be able to go into a place, assess what the thing, you might not like what some of the people do, but you got to make something work. And that's what we've got to focus, focus on. Yeah. Well, listen, it's been an interesting conversation, and I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us. There's so much to digest, and uh, thank you so much for all you do, man, and sitting down with me. It's a pleasure to it's meet you. Pleasure. All right.